Companies nowadays are so product-centric that they forget the most crucial aspect to surviving in any industry that they are in, their customers. You can glean on where they are coming from. There are so many similar companies out there that it becomes too challenging to create a compelling product or service. Tune in as Michael Peterson talks with Ted Olson as he answers why businesses struggle, the importance of trust, and why creating a compelling message is key to a successful company. I want to welcome you to the Dominate Your Market podcast, where we interview leaders, CEOs, founders, and high-impact business development professionals to get their insights on how you can grow your business efficiently and build an amazing company. Today's guest is an entrepreneur and consultant. Ted Olson leverages talent optimization technology and this sales and marketing experience to help individuals and organizations develop strategic sales process, processes include demand generation and messaging. Ted is the best-selling author of Feel Good About Selling, a book written to help reluctant sellers become trusted advisors. For his downtime, Ted writes, builds websites, interesting, and practices martial arts. Oh, boy. Ted, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. Great to be here. Martial arts. So what's your, what's your degree? Are, are you a black belt? Uh, well, interesting. So it, in the U.S., we tend to sort of think of belts because we're so used to kar karate is so popular. And I I dabbled in karate, but I found that I, I came into martial arts much later in life. And I found that karate was going to be very physically demanding on my body. Yeah. And I wanted something that would um, I could do into my 80s. Right. Oh, nice. I like that. And I, like I discovered Wing Chun. Wing Chun is a Chinese martial art that was popularized by Ip Man, the only martial art developed by a woman. And hmm. it was the one that Bruce, that was Bruce Lee's foundation. Ooh, okay, so okay. It's a, it's a wonderful martial art. It keeps me fit and it makes exercise fun. Well, you're speaking my language when it comes to being fit and fitness is a huge part of my life. And in that yellow book right behind us, the first couple of chapters talk all about, you know, kind of health, well-being and how that links to your mind and your mindset and all of it all goes together. And it's unfortunate in our country. And I don't want to go off on this tangent, but, you know, a lot of people just don't prioritize the health until it's too late. Yeah. And as we get older in life, I'm sure you've experienced this. I mean, I had just recently on Facebook and I'm not a big Facebook guy, but a, a gentleman in my class just um, passed away and he was actually quite quite fit. Um, but he didn't catch uh, colon, colon cancer early enough. But I was like, mm. Oh, my God, he's my age, like yeah. in my class. And that really hit home to me. So yeah, uh, I'm glad to hear that you're you're into fitness and into longevity. But I want to get into this sales topic, because uh, I've been I've been doing sales since I was nine. And, okay. and I'm sure you'll get a paper you know, out. Uh, mowing the lawns first, knocking on doors. Oh, and there mowing, you go. Mowing lawns. Nice. And uh, that was age nine. And uh, I just turned 59. So I guess sales for half a half a century. All right. So a long, long time. But so I feel like we're kindred souls. But tell me in this in today's ultra competitive environment, what do you think sellers struggle with the most? I mean, you know, attention deficit disorder, all these things. I mean, get on LinkedIn and everybody's pitching everybody and, you know, cold, it's just a crazy world out there. So where do you think sellers are struggling the most? Yeah, I I think that's a great question, um, and I could, we could go in a lot of different directions. But I'll, mm -hmm. I'll put I'll I'll throw one one chip on the table, and I would say that most sellers are not thinking about the prospect in from their perspective. They are focused on them, their product, their service, um, and that and the clients customers feel that, so they are not positioning themselves well. Uh, they don't know even how to have a, 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 a conversation. It's it's this script that they've been taught that's been passed down that's filled with sales tactics that no longer work. Um, it's rigid. It's forced. It doesn't feel right to the buyer who is anywhere on the uh, on the journey. Oh, boy, so for sure. here's one thing. How do you know where your buyer is on the journey, right? Um, so I think that it's a it's a um, a non, uh, it's a they're non-client centric. 
And they're just not thinking about it from the buyer perspective. They're thinking about what they want versus making a hero versus um, helping somebody solve a problem. They're trying to get stuff. And people feel that and they'll just going to, they'll reach out to you when they need you. But if yeah. they see you as a trusted guide, that becomes a different story. Well, you, you know, what's interesting. Um, and I'm experiencing this right now, even in my business and with all the clients I work with is that, you know, there's this thing called sales cycle, right? And I think a lot of people, the one call close, the, the one email this, the one that, right? To, to just like lock it in and think that it's going to happen right now. And like you said, I think if they don't find out where that person's at in the buyer's journey, which it's a whole chapter in my book, by the way, the buyer's journey, right? If they don't find out where that person's at, then you're not speaking the right language. You, I mean, you are literally, I mean, you're, you're, you're going to be a robot. So, so, I mean, talk about that a little bit, this, this sense of like uh, the, the urgency to close the deal, you know, this, talk, talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, that urgency will come off as commission breath, right, versus helpful. So that's never good. Um, and I love that you have a chapter in your book. And I love that. I even love the color of your book. Like I'm looking at it compared to mine. I'm like, oh, I should have went yellow. And how, um, how, how do you like my shirt, by the way? There's a little bit of your shirt and everything. Intentional, like draws intentional your branding right here. <laughs> I, I'm going to change my shirt so that people catch. I'm going to put a light on my book. See? There you but go. I think that um, there's, I think sale, sales as movements. So there's the movement of getting someone's attention to interest. Um, and a lot of salespeople will say, oh, I've got somebody's interest. Let me now pitch you. Well, no, 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 no. You need to take that interest and get buy-in. And buy-in is they see you as a potential solution. Not so. And then the salesperson will say, oh, great. Now I can close. It's like, no, 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 no. Now you need to take that buy-in and have them own it. That's their decision. What's your process for executing that? Um, that so trying to like force urgency, fake urgency. Those are all FOMO tactics. Yeah. Uh, fear of missing out. You know, dial up the dial up the fear, uncertainty. You know, get them set the house on no, the old challenger approach of set the house on fire so they yep. want to leave and come into your new environment. Now that can work early in the sales cycle and it's helpful in the sales cycle. And we certainly wanna help people out of situations that aren't good. So don't hear me say that. Um, but if you wanna read some new research on what's really happening, The Jolt Effect is a very powerful book Ooh, that will tell you that I it is that. less about FOMO, FOMO and more about FOMU. People are afraid of messing hmm. up. It's okay. the fear of messing up. So you need to help people, um, not just with their buying journey, but with their decision journey. How do you help them feel Ooh, confident journey. I like in that. their decision? Hmm. And that requires being a trusted guide. That requires creating a safe space. That requires being clear on the problem you solve for them, casting vision, making it simple. These are techniques that... Um, Sellers are not taught. Uh, and so I go into quite a few of them in my book. I just happen, and I referenced the jolt effect in my book because I knew it was coming. Um, and the research just supports essentially the practical application that you find in my book. You'll have to uh, email me that book again because I, I'm a book junkie for sure, no doubt about it. Um, sure. Uh, one thing I want to talk about with you is when you're in the conversation, and I'm I talk to a lot of uh, clients and even like their sales, the, the sales guys in these companies of my clients about um, extracting <laughs> pain, how much is. And so like I just did a LinkedIn post, like not even 20 minutes ago. And the post goes, never talk cost of your product or service before you extract their pain and how much it's costing them to not make a change. How do you feel about that? You know, there's some old research from Gong that used to say, hold off, like they did the, they looked at the numbers and said, sellers who held off on the price until the end, their close rates just skyrocketed. But the world has changed a little bit. And I haven't seen the new research, but I've seen the new change of sellers actually introducing price early on. Um, but I don't know what the, the effect is on the actual close rate. Mm. Um, so that's sort of where I stand right now. I think so what I will say, it's very context dependent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you are in a 
uh, competitive landscape that sort of everyone has a general idea of the price, you might want to get it out there. Yep. Um, but a lot of folks I work with are in uh, complex selling environments, uh, putting together long-term solutions yep. uh, or long-term engagements. And that's a little different. Um, you know, uh, a lot of my clients are B2B. And, um, you know, one thing that, that I, I iterate with everybody on, on, in the team is that you're still dealing typically with one human to another human, right? Like it's B2, whether, no matter what it is, it's still one human to another human. Mm-hmm. And that other human has a life. And that other human has things going on in their day. And so, you know, the conversation sometimes it gets very, very, like you said, almost too aggressive, too pushy when you don't know what this person's going through. And then and you don't know what their motivations are um, when they make their decision or how they make their de- decision. Right. And, and I had a, uh, an on-site meeting with a, with a client the other day. And we talk about that where just I mean. When you're in a meeting and talking to these people, you really don't know what's going on in their life. And you don't know what the, the decision process is in a company without, without kind of truly asking about it. Like, hey, what's the process look like? You know, like if you're selling X, whatever that may be, service, product, whatever, software, and you're talking to, to the person. And maybe that person isn't the buyer, but they're the person that was, was tasked to talk, go out and get quotes, however that may look, right? Well, so it, you, I feel like there needs to be clarification on, hey, what's that process look like, Sally? Uh, when somebody is looking at one, a product like ours, what's that look like? How do you feel about that? You know, where you're trying to kind of get a feel of the landscape for that potential prospect and kind of what that, what that so you can kind of lay out, you can almost lay out the sales process. How do you feel about that? Yeah, that's a great question. There was some data from... C- CEB that was bought by Gartner, um, the challenger guys, the challenger sale, challenger customer. And when they first released their book, they're like, hey, there's six or seven people involved in the buying process. Did you know that? And everyone, that was like a revelation to the sales industry. Uh, and it's actually continued. Um, now there's like 10 or 12. I mean, it's just more people involved. <laughs> um, but I think that, I think it's how you frame it. Because I think a lot of a, a lot of folks who, in sales are, are a little aggressive in how they ask their questions because what they're tr- what again what they're trying to do is get something versus help somebody on a journey they're trying to win versus helping their hero win so yeah. when you have that mindset you can teach them all day long um and they still won't get it what we have to help sellers do is realize that they are a trusted advisor they're a coach they're a guide they are not the hero of this story for crying out loud. You want to make your prospect the hero. You want to put the sword in their hand so yep. they can slay their dragon. And the way you do that in this particular case is to say something like, hey, typically in situations like this and working with folks like yourself, I want you to be successful. And I know there's a lot of things behind the scenes that happen um, in a purchase decision like this. What does your process look like? And they'll tell you when you ask it like that, I want you to be successful. Beautiful. Help me understand what's going on behind the scenes so that nothing comes out of the woodwork that could impact the goals that you're after. You that that sense, I want I want to help you be successful. Every everybody wants to be the champion, right? I mean, we we all want to be the hero, right? Of our own story. And and I think a lot of these people, especially in these these complex or these complex buying situations where the person you're talking to most likely isn't the sole decision maker for sure. For sure. And and yet, but a lot of pressure is on them, right? Because, you know, let's say the CEO or the higher ups would turn to that person and say, well, tell me who, who, who do you think? Right. And then, oh boy, oh boy. Right. Because now they've got to really, if they say, well, oh, go with, you know, Ted, Ted's amazing. And Ted does not a good job. Well, then that's on them. And, so and that's the fear of messing up. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. why they're not choosing you. You, you uh, sellers continue to go back to these tactics of, hey, remember why this is important and all the value they provide. They're like, yeah, yeah, no, I get that. So they're already they're already at the point where they've made a decision and they know they need to do something, but now they can't make the decision <laughs> because what happens? What comes in? What, what's behind fear? 
there's a, there's a nasty emotion behind fear that very few people talk about in sales. It's called shame. Ooh, okay. And what you just said was they feel the pressure. They've got eyeballs on them. Well, if they make a decision to work with you, Mike, and it, it doesn't go well, that's shameful. That's wow. embarrassing. People will go to great lengths to not feel that emotion, even to the point of inaction, because it's oh, safer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not paralysis by analysis, but it's definitely a freezing point where it's just like, whoa, I, 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 I'm not comfortable here. I am not comfortable here. And people, if people aren't comfortable, typically they're not going to take an action. And it's often silent. You don't know it. You won't hear it. Um, good sellers can usually, again, create that safe space so they can help the dr buyer draw it out. That's why I spend so much time on, well, that's why I wrote a book that says for, for non-sales people, because they wanted to sell and they wanted to help people, but they were turning to all these great books, Yeah. but they were filled with stuff that didn't sit right with them. Um, and when you actually go back to the core of selling, which is to actually help somebody on a journey and allow them to make that decision, then selling becomes very different. Now you feel good about helping somebody. Yeah. How do you feel about like, um, and I've got this issue with a couple of clients right now where the sales guys, um, the, the potential prospect that they felt was a hot prospect, like, oh boy, we're close. This is close. They go dark. They go dark, you know? Yeah. And again, um, I, I know a couple of answers, but I want to hear it from you because you're the pro. What, what, what does a salesperson do in that situation where they almost even felt like, wow, this, this, this is in the bag. Like this is a done deal. And all of a sudden it goes dark and they maybe send a couple of emails out or whatever, no response. What, what do you do in that situation? Cause that can be really frustrating for the salesperson for sure. Right. Sure. And like, what happened? What happened? Yeah. So that's, you know, the, the traditional phrase for that is happy ears, right? The, the salesperson got excited they, they had this great conversation. They felt good about it, but they don't truly understand what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so those feelings on the side of the salesperson, those are not good indicators of whether or not the sale will close. What the good indicators are, did you set clear expectations for the next step? Like, what is that next step? Did they agree to that next step? Um, so that would be one. Another one would be, um, what are the facts? Like, are they are they responsive to your emails? Are they responsive to your calls? Did they postpone the call or did they say, we're going to need to rethink this at a later date? Those are two very different things. One is they're, they're, they're procrastinating. They're sort of delaying the decision. But the other is actually indecision. And you'll see this again, I'm going to reference the jolt effect because I'm getting so much from it. I'm like, oh yeah, that's what's happening. And now I have data and now I have data ah. to prove this. Um, but yeah, we, I think we want to actually be helping sellers read between the lines a little more to know how people are actually making a decision Yeah, uh, and even yeah. call it out. Help me understand your decision-making process. What's your criteria so I can help you be successful? Right. So I can give you what you need. Right. So we don't waste anyone's time. Um, yeah. And then I think there's a lot of pipeline furniture. Right. There's a lot of people just they, they like this deal. They keep moving it forward. They keep moving it forward. It's going to close. It's going to close. It's like, well, what what is making you say that? Like, What's really happening? Well, you know, um, and I think the better sellers tend to know when someone is um, just sort of kicking the tires. Well, you know, I love your your term happy ears. I like that, right? Yeah. And, and we've all had it. Sure. I've had it. I've had it with prospective clients, you know, in my consulting where I got up a call and I was like, wow, this is great. Uh they they went dark. They they didn't respond to an email or two, didn't respond to a text message, even, right? And you're like, whoa, what happened? And again, if, if you're smart, it's not a failure you have to learn from it. And, and one way for me is I tried to reach out to them and say, hey, I feel like I've failed you. I feel like I've, you know, I, I do sort of an emotional outreach where I want to get them to know I'm a human. So I'll say, you know, I feel like I failed you, you know, uh, and I kind of start that conversation like, oh, no, 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 no. And then typically you get an answer. And so, uh, and I, I feel like that, that humanistic approach of, 
you know, gosh, did I, did I fail you? You know, I feel like I let you down, mm. and, you know, and my, some people might say, oh, that, what a tactic that is or whatever. But for me, it, it's really authentic. I really do feel like, hey, I want to find out, did I, did I screw up here? Yeah, I, I think it's a fair, fair approach. Uh, another one is, um, especially if we're talking B2B, what could be effective is what I call the double tap. And that is if you have someone who is um, on the fence, I'm sorry, if you have someone who's not responding, they've ghosted you. And you know, you've tried calling, you've tried LinkedIn, you've tried the video. By the way, most folks don't even do any of that. They just send the same email, following oh, up, God. Oh, haven't yeah. heard back, oh. following oh. up, haven't heard back. Like they don't think about maybe sending them a LinkedIn voice message. Oh, that's a thing, right? Maybe sending them a personalized video. Um, uh, and to your point, just getting real personally, hey, I, I, I want to make sure that I haven't made a misstep here because people don't want that for you either. And they will respond in a human way. But I think what I what I do, and I, and I write about this in my book, is um, I call it out. Uh, hey, it sounds like this is no longer a priority. Am I reading you right? Ooh. Okay, what that will do is now you often get, no, 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 sorry, Ted. No, I just got back from vacation or my daughter had a baby, whatever. It's, it's sometimes it's like that. Uh, and the next one is if I don't hear back, um, hey, I haven't heard back. I'm going to close this out for now. If things change, let me know. And then boom, I'm moving on. Uh, I'm not going to chase. Yeah, yeah. But, but let me be clear. I've done a whole heck of work. I've executed a process to make sure that I can help them in every possible way before I just cut ties. Uh, but at some point, I need to put my energy into uh, more fruitful customers. Those two, those two statements are gold. Holy crap. I mean, this is what I love about this podcast is, is I really want my guests to just drop some bombs. Like really just, you know, that, are, you know, that I think some gentleman on LinkedIn uh, just said, I'm tired of all the same old stuff. You know, I want news. I thought it was very aggressive, by the way. And I thought, ooh, I wonder how this is going to go for this guy. And he's kind of a bit, you know, 10 or 20,000 connections and all of that. But I thought that was a very aggressive thing to say. Because mm. when you look at sales, you look at marketing, you look at mindset, personal development, whatever it is. There's nothing that's really rocket science, right? Like a lot of people just like, Reword like Tony Robbins, for example. I'm a huge fan of Tony Robbins. Have have been from the first day he came out. Well, what did he do? He read from people that were you know from previous generations, put his own twist on it. He's six foot five, two hundred eighty pound, massive dude with a massive mouth and all of that. And and he he repackaged it. So you know, I don't think there's anything in our world nowadays, especially with the internet, that this new, I think you just, you throw out ideas you th and those two things that you said, I don't think I, I don't want to say I've never heard of them before, but they're fantastic. Really, really good. Like I, I'm going to go back and clip that out. And um, that's really, really good stuff. So it, it's interesting that I think some people, uh, they expect something just amazing or something brand new that's not out there in the market. And that's not the case, but this podcast is a way for people like you to just state, state, state those sentences like you did that are really impacting that a salesperson can take away and go, wow, I, I'm going to use that. That was really, really good. That was good. So I thank good. you. I'm for glad. That. I've had some great sales mentors. So that one came from a sales mentor. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah. I, want to, I want to ask you a question. So why another sales book? So there are hundreds thousands i don't know and i've got in my library i've got probably 30 30 or 40 so mm. why why another sales book i'll give you two reasons one is that and someone just said hey what's your favorite someone posted hey what's your favorite sales book i see that question all the time and i said i can't pick i can't pick a favorite but i'll list my top five and i you know i wrote how to win friends and influence people uh influenced by cialdini or caldini however you say his name. Mm -hmm. Um, I wrote the challenge of customer jolt effect, never split the difference. I said, these are all great books. However, if you don't like selling to begin with, none of those will help you. Here's my point. The book that I wrote 
is here's the reality. Most sales books are written by salespeople for salespeople. There's already assumption. There's already this assumption that, oh yeah, we're, we're in the game, right? And, and we think and, and hmm. believe in a certain way. And the problem is a lot of those assumptions are wrong and they're, they're not good for people. They're actually harmful. So I wrote a book for people that don't like salespeople. That's the difference. Um, yeah, sales books are written by salespeople for salespeople. I wrote a book for people that don't like salespeople. Gosh, is that the best way to define your book right there? I mean, and, and I think there are so many people out there, especially with this, this, this kind of great resignation, quiet quitting, all these things mm. where people are leaving their jobs. And um, they're, they're changing careers, a lot of them. They're working from home, whatever it may be. I, I, I've heard the phrase a ton of times, I hate selling. God, it makes me feel uncomfortable. I just don't like it. I know I have to do it, but I just hate it. So the way you describe that, that does differentiate your book, by the way. And that's part of what I talk about in my book is how do you differentiate? And you just did it perfectly right there. That was- Yeah, if you want to stick out, uh, don't compete, contrast, right? Differentiate, be different. Being better is not enough. You might be the, you might have the best product in the world, but you know what? That's not what matters. Um, that's not what's going to get your prospects attention. You need to be different. You need to show them how, how, how you're different Yep. Um, in order to st stand out. Okay. In, in wrapping this up, I do have to say, since the name of the show is Dominate Your Market, mm. can, can you give our listeners a strategy that's working right now to gain market share, any kind of a strategy. And I guess it would, it would be towards salespeople, but what, what's a strategy that's working right now that you feel like could help people gain market share? Or, or if you want, you could talk to it on the customer side as well, either way. So here, as you mentioned earlier, there's, there's, not a, there's nothing new under the sun, but there's a lot that's been forgotten. Ooh. And the sales strategy that I think is most effective is consistency around the problem you solve for your customers. So a consistent message over and over and over again about the problem you solve. Let me give you an example. Anytime you ask me uh, about sell, sell, selling, I'm gonna focus on non-salesy sales because there's a problem, right? So how, how am I addressing that problem? I'm telling, showing people how to become a trusted advisor, right? I'm casting a new, a new way of doing selling. So I have an entire story that I can talk about. And I focus on that one problem um, that there's a lot of people out there that don't feel good about selling. It does not have to be this way. And so I tell them how to do that from hundreds of different angles. And I think that brands, companies, sellers, they try something for a little bit and it didn't work and they give up. So then they try something else. And they actually dilute their message rather than focusing in on one from thousand. What's that? What was that book? Uh, another great book. I, can't, I, I, know, I know. I've been, I've, been Essentialism. My, I, I've been squinting my eyes trying to read what books you got back right there. <laughs> Essentialism. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it, there's a great squiggly line in there that talks about the focus, the power of just focusing in on one thing. And if you can hit that core and focus in on that core, um, that is a strategy that pays off. You see the greatest companies doing that. Focus on that one core. I love that. That is awesome. Well, Ted, thank you so much for your time today. It was really, uh, you know, I, I can talk sales all day long. I love it, right? I, Because I, I, I've been selling for so long and I do. And there are, there are a lot of accomplished sales professionals out there. And I know them on LinkedIn and, and they'll also probably be on my show as well. But it, for you to have you on and really talk about it from a different angle is is refreshing very very refreshing because and just even your demeanor is just it's i the vibe you give off is just very human very just uh, you don't have that you know for me i do have a tendency to be very in, intense i'm a very very alpha right so mm -hmm. and when i get on calls i can get alpha in a big way and you know uh, that's not always the great way to do it i talk um, about that in my book well, well, we're going to talk about your book right now. So for, for our listeners, give us the name of the book again. Give us any websites, any ways to contact you that you're comfortable with. Share all that information right now before we end this thing. So certainly feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter. 
Uh, you can find me pretty easily. Uh, and the book is available, Feel Good About Selling at Amazon. Feel and good about selling, increase your sales, keep your integrity, um, and you can search it right on Amazon. And spell your last name for everybody. I can spell, but you spell your last Olson. name for everybody. Yeah, it's O-L-S-O-N. Ted O-N. Olson. Oh, O-N, not yeah. the E-N. O-N. You can, you see, I, I, caught up, I caught up with that because mine gets misspelled when they hear that it's pronounced Peterson. Right, they put the T in there? The, the T and the O on the end. Sure. Well, it's all E's and a all D. All E's, yeah, I saw that. All E's and a D. And everybody would call that what? Pedersen, but right. it's, Nor- it's Norwegian, Scandinavian. So there you right. go. But Ted, thank you so much for being on the show today. I so appreciate it. Yeah, great to have uh, great to have a conversation with you, Mike. Um, really enjoyed it. Well done, sir. Well All right, done. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was awesome. So um, this will go out probably next week and I'll send you like an image. I'll send you some links. You can promote that to your tribe and networks. And um, it'll, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's done. I don't know if you've heard any of the show so far. Not yet. Um, yeah, we've got an outro and a this and a that. It's very, very okay. professional. It, it's nice. gonna, it, it'll turn out. You'll, you'll, you'll be proud of it. And it's, it's a nice positioning for you to just kind of, you know, and it, it promotes the book. You know, and I am going to go buy your book right now, by the way. So I'm going to go buy your book. So nice, I appreciate it. And I got that sense, Mike. I could see when you advertise some of your other podcasts. I'm like, oh, there's someone who's doing it right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's. Um, I like the idea of value, like provide value for the listeners. Um, and I, I am getting some people that fill out my questions in that Calendly and I can get, it screams promotion. I'm like, dude, that ain't going to happen. Yeah. That ain't going to happen on my podcast. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. You know, I mean, because here's the thing, and you know this in sales, if you become a value provider, you provide value, they're going to want what you got. Yeah. They're, they're going to want to engage with you because they're like, this guy, every time I hear him talk or everything he says on LinkedIn or whatever is really good stuff. I got to talk to this guy as opposed to buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, buy my, no, nobody wants that anymore. So I am excited to get your book and I am going to order it and I will give you feedback on it when I get it. But uh, thank you so much. Have an awesome day over there. And I will give you a heads up via email uh, with all the information of the live podcast. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Great Thanks, to chat. Ted. You got it. Bye-bye. You've just listened to the Dominate Your Market podcast with CEO business consultant and author, Michael Peterson. Growth-minded CEOs hire Michael to explode their revenues, build an amazing company, and create a transformational mindset that encapsulates growth, success, and ultimately, happiness. His book, Dominate Your Market, is creating quite a stir in the marketplace. Go to dominateyourmarketbook.com and get your first chapter free.